Uh, Psalm 139. The Gilamot. The Gilamot is a, is a small Arctic seabird that lives on the rocky cliffs of, of northern coastal regions. You'll see them up in, a, in Alaska and various nice places up there like that. They flock together by the thousands in comparatively small areas. And because of the crowded conditions, hundreds of females, they'll lay their small pear-shaped eggs side by side on a very narrow ledge. In fact, you can see them sometimes. Just boom, 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 boom. Just thousands of them on these little ledges all across uh, these cliffs in a long row. And since the eggs all look alike, it's incredible that a mother bird can identify those eggs that belong to her. And yet studies show she knows her own eggs so well that even when one is moved a good distance away, she'll find it and return it to its original location. Because of our massive world population, and increased usage of computer technology, we are fast becoming numbers and statistical units rather than meaningful individuals. Machines are slowly taking the place of workers. Computers can do much more, much faster, with greater accuracy than even skilled specialists. Science doesn't help the problem. They say that our universe is so huge and so vast that Earth is really insignificant. A speck of matter surrounded by galaxies, measured by light years rather than miles. And when we begin to think about it, the, the immensity of it all just overwhelms us ordinary earthlings, us plain old people. We just get overwhelmed. And, and, and we think, well, we're just on this mud heap spinning around in outer space. Why? Why are we here? Why? Where do I fit in all of this universe? And really, what does it matter? Who cares? And with over 7 billion people now on this planet, it's easy to wonder if God even knows we exist, much less whether or not he even cares. However, the revelation of God in the Bible, in the Holy Scriptures, it demonstrates a profound truth. God is like the mother guillemot bird who always knows her eggs. Even while we are in our mother's womb, waiting to be born, the creator of all heaven and earth not only knows us and loves us, but he has a plan and a purpose for us. Say amen. amen. In Psalm 139, illustrates this. Our personal, individual, and special importance to God. Would you look at Psalm 139 and verse number 1. Psalm of David, and he says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my down city and my uprising. You understand my thought afar off. David came to realize, and the Lord, I think, revealed it to him, that our God fully knows our most intimate thoughts and accepts us just as we are. God not only knows our name, He knows us through and through. So what He's saying, if, oh Lord, verse 1, oh Lord, you have searched me through and through, and you know me. You know my down sitting, 
my uprising? You understand my thoughts way before I even think of them. Afar off. The Hebrew word translated search there in verse number one, it originally meant to explore. So the Hebrew, the word here, sometimes conveys the idea of exploring as in digging into or through something to see what's there. And the thought is that God explores us. He digs into our thoughts and our hearts and our, and our spirit and he examines us inside and out. And then David says that he looks at two phases of our lives when we're down sitting and when we're up rising. Now you have to go back and look at that. We don't talk in those terms too often, down sitting and up rising, but down sitting means our most common and casual laid back moments. He is in those moments and those moments when we're completely relaxed, totally uh, just kind of kicked back. It, he is completely familiar with all of our thoughts and all what's going on in our lives when we're completely laid back. He's also knows our uprising. Now that's the other time, that's the opposite. That's when we are most hectic, we're most active, we got so much to do, we don't know how we're gonna get it all done. And he, all of those moments are not missed by the Lord. Even our thoughts are naked and exposed before Almighty God. That's what he says in verse number two. In the last part, you understand my thoughts afar off. One of the old Greek philosophers years ago in the first century, a guy named Plutarch, he, he wrote about God knowing uh, everything. He said, man may not see you do an impious deed, but God, your very inmost thoughts, can read. He's right. With people, we can sometimes intuitively see thoughts that come in and go, go in and come out of their minds. I mean, Sherry, Sherry and I have been, been married for like 35 years, and, and sometimes I'll be sitting at the table, and maybe I, I will, I'll, I'll be thinking about getting some one of the items that's on the table for to eat, or maybe I didn't have a fork, and I'll just kind of glance. And she said, what do you need, a fork? <laughs> I said, how did you know that? She said, well, I can see the thoughts. You know, sometimes you can, you can when, you, when you've been married or been around somebody for a long, long time, you know them real well, you can, you can kind of see the thoughts that's occurring to them, and, and, you know what, and you know what they're thinking. Well, God knows our thoughts even deeper than that, a hundred million times deeper than that. He knows our thoughts coming and going and everything in between. He knows us better than we know ourselves. God minutely studies all of our choices and decisions in life. He's that interested in each one of us. Look at verse number three. Look at verse number three of Psalm 139 where David realizes, he says, God, you compasses my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, you know that word all together. Now the Hebrew word translated compassest in, in verse number three. It says, thou compassest my path. Uh, in my study Bible there, in the, in the middle margin, it's got a, a, a reference there that says, winnowest. Winnowest. Now, our life's direction is winnowed by the Lord. And for some of us that aren't too good at farming, we wouldn't pick up on that too much. When a farmer winnows the grain, he sifts through it. And so the Lord is sifting through 
All of our choices, all of our decisions, all of our thoughts. Look at verse 3. You winnow or compass my path, my decisions, which way I'm going to go. And my lying down, where I'm going to take rest and where I'm going to get up, what I'm going to do. And you are acquainted with all my ways. For there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, Lord, you know it all together. Here's where we need to submit ourselves to the idea that every aspect of our lives is under the scrutiny of the Lord Almighty. Every aspect of our life is exposed and naked before him with whom we have to do. It, 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 it's done in love, but it's still done. He knows us, he looks at us, he examines us, he, he, he thinks about, meditates upon what we're thinking about and meditating upon. And the Lord studies us so carefully that he knows our words even before we speak them. Now this could be a scary thought. Or it could be a comforting thought. Then it's a scary thought because that means we have no secrets from God. Uh, that's a scary thought. But it's also comforting because that means no tattletale can come over there and knows our business and tell God get us in trouble. God already knows it. Amen. Amen. So we don't have to worry about those tattletales, and no enemy can make an accusation against us because God already knows everything. No forgotten skeleton can come tumbling out of some hidden closet to embarrass us and expose our past. God knows them all. He knows what's in the closets. No unsuspected weakness of our character can come to light and turn God away from us. He knew. He knew us utterly before we knew him. And God still calls us into his salvation. With all of our wickedness, with all of our imperfections, with all of our shortcomings, with all of our sins, with all of our transgressions, he says, I still love you. I want you to come. Amen. I want you to come. He loves us and wants us to be with him. And you got to think about that. With full knowledge, he with full knowledge of every cop, big and black mark ever made on our record. With full knowledge of that, he still says, I love you and I want you to come to me. I love you and I want you to be mine. God fully knows our most intimate thoughts and welcomes us just as we are. You see, what we've got to think is when we think we're nothing but a nobody, it's time to remember everybody is somebody to God. Amen. So our our God fully knows our most intimate thoughts and accepts us just as we are. But God also fully knows our spiritual road to maturity. And he steadies us continually. Would you look at verse number 5? Look at verse number 5, Psalm 139. David says, God, you have beset me behind and before Laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I just can't attain unto it. You see, God welcomes us. I mean, that in itself is absolutely awe-inspiring and stunning that God welcomes us just as we are, knowing the sinners that we all are. He still loves us and accepts us. But once we come to him, this is another awesome truth. Once we come to him, he accepts us just as, he, as we are, but he wants to make us so much more better than what we used to be, say amen. amen. The Hebrew word translated beset in verse number five. It was used of besieging a city in battle. It means that it's surrounding the place. And, and, it, and it's the idea of closing off all of escape routes. And one Hebrew scholar actually said it meant to be hemmed in on all sides. So 
So the Lord besets us sometimes. And He hems us in on all sides. And He places us into inescapable situations. That's what He's saying in verse 5. He says, you have beset me behind and before. Sometimes the Lord puts us, hems us up, and makes us face the furnace of affliction. He turns up the heat, and he just brings it. But in every intense situation, God is there to steady us. To steady us. Look at the last part of that verse. Even though you've beset me, you've let all these things hem me in and surround me and, and besiege me behind and before, I have no escape route. Yet, lay your hand upon me. I was thinking about this passage this morning before I even walked over uh, to, to the church house and I remember as a 10-year-old boy, my Uncle Charles, and many of you know my Uncle Charles from down in Atlanta, and his wife Claire, they've come up and sang for us over the years and done some things, but this was his first wife's name was Jenny, way back in, uh, in my early, early uh, youth, and she had cancer, and back in those days, they didn't have anywhere near what they had took her to Buffalo, New York, trying to, trying to find something that would help her. And in the meantime, they had a little boy, my, my first cousin, Brian. His name was Brian Tidwell. And he was like one years old when all this started happening. And in about two years of battle with that cancer, Jenny passed away. And during that time, my uncle was so involved with the care of his wife that they actually let Brian, my little cousin, stay in our house. And he stayed with us for, for months. I don't, I don't even remember how long it was. I'm about 10 years old. He's like two or three years old. His mom's dying, and his dad's trying to, to attend to her. And, and this little baby, this little boy, two or three years old, one night, my mom, as good of, as good as you know my mom, she's just... Her heart, she could get any baby to rest, to sleep, to calm down, stop crying. She could not get him to stop crying. She rocked him, she, she petted him, she paced the floor with him, she, she, she brought him. And then I'm dead asleep as a 10 year old boy. In the middle of the night, she flips the light on in my bedroom. And I'm going, Mom, Mom, why do you turn the light on? Brings in this little three-year-old boy, Brian, and puts him beside my bed. I just I could barely see him from the brightness of the light. And I said, What? <laughs> and, and here's this little boy, and he's trembling like this. And his little lips are going. <laughs> <clears throat> and she tells me that she can't get in. <laughs> and I don't know, even as a 10 year old boy, I said, well, okay, yeah. So he gets in, he lays beside me, I'm laying on my side, and he's laying here beside me on his back. And the bed's going. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, I am never going to get to sleep. But then as he's crying, and
he says, you laid your hand on me. The last part, verse number five. I was shaking. And I was trembling. I was crying. I couldn't get settled down. I couldn't get, I couldn't get calm.
is he realized that no matter how rocky the journey got, God was going to hold him up. Amen. God was going to hold him up. I get in, in verse 6, David shared the same feelings I think that young man and that passenger train had. Look at verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. God's going to hold me up. That's just, that's so high. And it's hard for me to comprehend that. It's hard for me to, to grab hold of that. My life is rocking and when I'm quivering and shaking and all messed up inside, he's going to lay his hand on me. He's going to hold me up. He's going to hold me up. Who am I? Who am I? Well, when we think we're nothing but a nobody, it's time to remember everybody is somebody. To the Lord, say amen. Amen. God fully knows our most intimate thoughts and accepts us just as we are. He fully knows our spiritual road to maturity and he steadies us continually. And God fully knows our greatest fears. And he gives us his presence daily. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Where shall I go and get away from your spirit? Or, or where shall I flee and get away from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. The Lord is not distant and far away, a preoccupied God with all of the other seven billion people on this planet. Our God is not the God of the deists of long, long ago. They believe that God kind of created the universe and wound it up like a clock and just let it go and he hasn't been a part of it or showed up or said anything since. Our God is not the God of the deists. The Bible paints a very different picture of God and this is his revelation. We wouldn't know anything about God if he didn't show us and tell us and the Bible tells us that he is almighty. And he is way up there. And he is lofty. But our Christian faith is the only religion and faith in this entire world that calls God our Father. Amen. No one else teaches. He is in this song. The, the, the pronouns here referring to God, they're abrupt and emphatic. He says, if I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave and to hell, make my bed there, you are there. We don't live in empty space everywhere we turn. Personal living God who created us all is there. Say amen. amen. For those of us who have eyes to see and ears to hear, we can see his hand. We can hear it still small voice. Verse 9 carries us on the rays of the morning light to the vast ocean. Look at, look at verse number 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Oh, you get out on the ocean where you can't see any land and you start feeling a little bit remote and removed. And I'm telling you, even though we're out there isolated and alone, look at verse number 10. He 
He said, even there shall your hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. No distance, distance is not going to make any difference for God being close to us. Not even darkness can separate us from the love and the presence of our God. Look at verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. Well, even the night will be turned to light about me. Yes, the darkness hides not from you, O God, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both the same to you. They're alike to thee. See what? Sometimes we'll say, why is it in the darkest hours of my life, sometimes I can't see God working? I just can't see it. I remember reading about Grace Groban, and she shared her story. Some time ago, it became necessary to break her small little daughter of the habit of sleeping with her, and so she laid the little child in her crib, kissed her goodnight, turned off the light. The little child girl cried long and bitterly. She, she thought her mother had abandoned her, and that, that her mother didn't hear her crying. She felt like her mom didn't love her anymore. But in reality, her mom's standing outside her door. And she was only hidden in the darkness. Mom's heart was aching, too. She heard the cries of her little girl. She longed to step out and comfort her, but for her daughter's own good, she knew she had to remain hidden. Well, sometimes it's that way with God. In the dark times of our lives, the Lord hears our cry. The Bible says he does. It's a promise. The Lord is near us. That's a promise. But the darkness makes us question. He feels our struggle. But in his wisdom, for our own good, God may hide his face. He may not seem to be listening. He may not seem to care. He may not seem to be near. But the Bible absolutely promises us that our Heavenly Father will never leave us or forsake us. Say amen. Amen. And that's what we have to bank on when it's dark. Beverly said that former Pastor Wearsby, she was under his ministry up in Kentucky, never doubt what God told you in the day fully knows our greatest fears, he's there. You believe that? Amen. He's there. Even when we think we're nothing but nobody, who, who would I be in God's big plan and purpose? When we think we're nothing but a nobody, it's still time to remember. It's time to remember based on God's word that everybody is somebody to God. Amen. And all God's people say, let's stay. That we had bowed and eyes closed. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Now maybe you're feeling a little isolated, a little lonely. Maybe your job is in jeopardy. On the hand, on the other hand, maybe your job is secure. But in recent days, your home is experiencing some cracks and some ruptures. Whatever it is, you're just finding it hard to get adjusted to the new circumstances of life to see how God can possibly be near. Well, if you'll humble yourself and surrender to God on His Word, the emptiness of your life can This is the time for you, right here, right now. This is the time for you to regain your standing with the Lord. He knows your most intimate thoughts and he accepts you just as you are. I invite you to come meet God in a place of prayer, kneeling at the altar here. Take a step of faith.
There's nothing about you that the Lord does not already know. There's nothing about you so evil that it could thwart the Lord's love for you. God hates sin, but he fully welcomes and loves you just as you are. Will you be willing to come to the altar of prayer and experience the kind of love from your Heavenly Father, which makes everybody somebody? Heaven can be yours. Heaven can be yours. Hell can be avoided. You can be a child of God. He wants you in his family. Step forward, let somebody show you from our church how to know the Savior in your heart. And then I don't know, it could be that the Lord has beset you behind and before, placed you in some kind of inescapable situation of pressure, and the heat's turning up. You need the Lord to hold you up and sustain you while that train is rocking. Would you just come to the altar? God, please let your hand lead me. Let your right hand hold me up. Calm me and steady me according to your will. It's time, man. It's time. Come pray that prayer. God is speaking to you through his spirit. Please come. In your struggle, you may have lost your sense of daily presence of Almighty God. Because of the darkness of your life, the smile of the Lord's face may seem to be hidden. Doesn't seem to hear your cries. Let me assure you, God's near. He's reachable, knowable, available, and real. And like that mother Gillibot bird, he knows where you are, and he wants to find you and bring you back and put you in his place where he wants you. You become just willing. Step forward and follow Jesus. What number do we have, Brother Robert? 657. Let's sing that. Search me, oh God, and hold my heart today. Try me, oh Savior, no Bad.